Please remain standing as we hear the reading of God's word from Psalm 144 and Ephesians chapter 6. Our text this evening, Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 13, as we begin a new mini-series within a series, our broader series on the book of Ephesians, as we consider that theme, that great theme of living in union with Christ. But now we zero in on this theme of spiritual warfare. And tonight we'll be considering how to prepare ourselves for spiritual warfare, for that battle that we face. And so let's hear now God's word from Psalm 144 and Ephesians 6. The Psalm of David. Blessed be the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. My loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him or the son of man that you are mindful of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains and they shall smoke. Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out your arrows and destroy them. Stretch out your hand from above. Rescue me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of foreigners, whose mouth speaks lying words, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of ten strings, I will sing praises to you, the one who gives salvation to kings who delivers David, his servant, from the deadly sword. Turn now to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Please be seated as we pray. O gracious God and Father, how we thank you that you have not left us as orphans in this world. How we thank you, O Lord, that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he is exactly what he promised your servant Abraham long ago. Our shield and our exceedingly great reward. How we thank you that we have a defender who is far mightier than the mightiest of the mighty that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is able to subdue us and sin within us, is able to rule and defend us, and is able to restrain all of His enemies and ours, including the devil. How we thank You that He demonstrated that power and that might in His estate of humiliation, showing even in that estate that he was a mighty king, able with a word to fell even legions of demons. What a great comfort that is for us, Lord. And how we thank you that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ demonstrated his great power and his victory over sin and death and the devil by triumphing over them in it at the cross. We pray now, O Lord, that you would work in our hearts to remember the things that you have said to us in your word and remembering them to draw upon these precious promises that will sustain us 
in the evil day. And we're reminded, Lord, that every day, in a certain sense, is an evil day. That we live in an age, in a world that is filled with evil. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would not be fearful, but that we would walk in boldness. And that we would walk in boldness because our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, has gone before us. As he went before Israel, as a light by day and a cloud by night, as a, a cloud by day and a light by night, we pray that we would follow our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he leads us all the way. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we begin the last major section of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, a section which has as its theme that great conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the enemy of our souls, that great serpent, the devil. It's a conflict that began long ago in the Garden of Eden when the serpent tempted Eve and she ate of the forbidden fruit and gave to her husband with her and he also ate. He, the representative of humanity, the covenant head, disobeyed God, fell into sin, and all humanity was swept away in a flood of sin and lies. It's a conflict that God himself initiates as we read back in Genesis 3.15 in that very first promise of the Savior in the Bible. And I will put enmity, I, God, will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, capital S, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In the previous section, which began at verse 22 and took us right into chapter 6, verse 9, we saw how every human relationship is transformed and elevated as the Spirit produces in us the fruit of our union with Jesus Christ. Every human relationship is transformed and elevated. Now the opposite was true in the fall. Every human relationship was affected by the fall. Mankind lost communion with God, and mankind lost the sweetness of fellowship and communion with one another, so that we became haters of God and haters of one another, as we read in the New Testament. We've already seen that the foundation of that section, that section that begins in verse 22, the foundation of that section was laid back in verse 18 with Paul's description of what it means to be the children of God and to walk worthy of our calling in this world. It means to be filled with the Spirit. And so the rest of... What Paul is saying is, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? The Christian life is the Spirit-filled life, a life that shows forth in this world that Christ really is risen. Christ really is risen. And we don't need to just talk about that one day of the year. But Christ is risen. And that's something that ought to be at the center of our thinking, at the center of preaching every single day and every single Lord's Day. Christ is risen. And the age of the Spirit has begun. The Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And the age of the Spirit of the risen Jesus is begun. Paul has shown how the Spirit-filled life comes to expression, especially in the Christian home, in the very closest and most personal and most ordinary of human relationships. And it's important for us to see now that it's in that context that we're to understand everything that follows. We began the book of Ephesians in the heavenly place, hearing of the blessings with which we've been blessed as a result of Christ's death and resurrection and our union with Him, we've gradually descended from the loftiest heights of theology and Christology and soteriology and ecclesiology and until we find ourselves now on the battlefield, in the trenches, putting on our gear and preparing for combat. Despite the wonderful 
and comforting reality of our union with Christ, we're now reminded of another reality, a daily reality. The reality that we have a very real and a very determined and a very dangerous and a very diabolical enemy, the devil, who goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But what this section teaches us, and children, I want you to hear this especially, what this section teaches us is that ultimately we have nothing to fear. Ultimately, we have nothing to fear. Because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Spiritual warfare is not an option for the children of God. And there are many ways that this idea of spiritual warfare is presented that are not helpful. Many ways that this idea of spiritual warfare is presented that are quite immature and not biblical. But spiritual warfare is not a topic that we should ever shy away from or seek not to understand or to ignore. We are called to wage this warfare as part of what it means to be a Christian. But we do so, as with everything else in the Christian life, in union with Christ, relying on Christ alone to fight for us and with us and in us and through us. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal because the warfare itself is spiritual, not carnal, not confined to this world of physical perception and sense. But what we learn here in this passage is of immense comfort to the children of God. What we learn is that we have all that we need in order to wage this warfare in Christ. We have everything that we need. And this is what Paul has been saying at every point throughout this letter. We have everything that we need to walk worthy of our calling in Christ, to walk as the children of God in this world. We have everything that we need, everything that we need supplied for us by the grace of God in His Son, Jesus. What we learn in this passage is of immense comfort. What we learn is that we have everything in Christ. It's a warfare that we can't possibly win in our own strength. But as we hope to see tonight, in our union with Christ, we have all the spiritual resources that we need to be more than conquerors through Him who loved us and laid His life down for us at the cross. We'll see that tonight as we continue, as we consider Ephesians 6, 10 to 13 in three points. First, our weakness... Second, Christ's strength. And third, God's armor. Our weakness, Christ's strength, and God's armor. Let's look first at our weakness. Great 20th century Puritan Martin Lloyd-Jones said that there is nothing more urgently important for all who claim the name of Christian than to grasp and to understand the teaching of this particular section of Scripture. Nothing more urgently important than to grasp the teaching of this particular section of Scripture. He goes on to say, and remember, Martin Lloyd-Jones is preaching in the middle part of the last century, that it wasn't so long ago that the home was more or less shut off from the world. Martin Lloyd-Jones talks about how the the wireless, he means the radio, and and other things have have invaded the home in a certain sense. And you can't get away from all of the influences that are flooding into the home. Well, there are ways that Martin Lloyd-Jones could not have even imagined that the world comes flooding into the home today. You see, his main point is still the same. For us in the 21st century, there has never been a time when fighting the good fight of faith has been more intense, more difficult, and more distressing in some ways than it is right now. Now, I'm not necessarily comparing ourselves to the martyrs. We face different dangers. We face different threats than the martyrs did. But what I'm saying is that there are certain things that we face, that people have never, ever faced before. The world is flooding into our homes 
like it has never flooded in before. In fact, not just our homes, but we have in our hand a flood of lies from the devil. Not that a cell phone is entirely bad. It can be used for good. It can be used for evil. But so often, that is the, fl- that is the source and the floodgate and the source of many, many temptations. If that is true, then it follows that there is nothing more urgent and more important than for us to know our enemy. That's the first thing that I was taught when I was in the army. You need to know your enemy. You need to think like your enemy in order to defeat your enemy. You need to know how your enemy is thinking. Or in the game of chess, you need to think like your opponent. You need to think of what your opponent's moves might be, several moves in advance. You need to know your enemy. But not only do we need to know our enemy, we need to know ourselves and and to know the abundant and the gracious provision that God has made for us in Christ and in our union with him. And all of that's here in this section of Scripture. The first thing that we need to see is the nature of this warfare in which we are engaged. This is a spiritual conflict. That's the point of verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. All of the evil that we see in the world around us, all of those things that we shudder to hear on the news, all of those things that when they happen, we say, what in the world is going on? Behind those things, there are principalities and powers. And behind those principalities and powers, there is a wicked devil at work who has been at work for millennia. But even behind all of this, all of this is the power and the wiles. And that word means plotting, scheming, scheming, conspiring, the kind of thing that you do when you're planning an ambush. Behind it all is the father of lies who was a murderer from the beginning. We are flesh and blood, but our enemy has an entirely different nature than we do. We can't see him. We can't hear or feel or sense or perceive him in any way. We only sense and perceive the effects of his influence. We have no weapons then with which to attack him. We have no armor, naturally speaking, that could defend us against his attacks. So what hope is there of ever overcoming him, much less of resisting him at all? And that's the first thing that we need to understand. Satan, the devil, is not a cartoon character with a pitchfork and horns. Satan is much more subtle, much more ingenious than that. He appears as an angel of light, transforming himself even into a minister of righteousness. He makes himself appear to be something pleasant and good, and he speaks words that seem on the surface to be true. That's how he's always worked. That's why he's so dangerous. I was reading the book of Revelation with my children. Chapter 13. The beast that comes up out of the earth. And there's another beast. And that beast looks like a lamb. Speaks like a dragon. That's the devil. That's what the devil's servants always do. And so... The truth is that we often think very little of the devil, especially in this secular age in which we live. We think little of the devil. We think little of the demonic hordes that do his wicked will. I know it's possible for us to think too much about the devil. We shouldn't do that either, to obsess about the devil, to become paranoid about the devil, to see the devil under every rock. But we need to remember that the devil is real. The spirit of the age in which we live would have us conveniently to forget this or to deny this or to ignore this. He's caricatured. He's lampooned. But the devil is real. 
Jesus was tempted by a real devil. We ignore this to our peril, you see. Jesus was tempted by a real devil. If this were not true, his temptations would not have been real. And if his temptations would not ha- were not real, then we do not have a Savior who met those temptations and fought them off with Scripture. Or even worse to consider, if the devil were not real, then Jesus' temptations would not have been external temptations, but internal temptations. And we would, have to, we would have to confess that we don't have a Savior who never sinned, because sin in the heart is sin. You see, Jesus was tempted, but he was only tempted externally, not internally. His temptations did not rise from himself or anything in him. His temptations were entirely external. And that's why he was never touched by sin, because he was God in the flesh. We have a Savior who never sinned, even in his heart. Not once did he even think a wrong thought. That's the kind of Savior that we have. But think about this. How often do we fail to realize the spiritual nature of what is happening in our lives? We immediately lash out at people. We see people as the problem. So often I'll say to spouses who are in conflict with one another in marriage, I'll say to them, you need to see sin as the problem. Your spouse is not the problem. Sin is the problem. And you need together, by the grace that God gives you, to be fighting the problem. Sin is the problem. The devil is the problem. Your spouse is not the problem. Your spouse is your companion, whom you are called to love. You see, we immediately lash out at people, even our brothers and sisters in Christ, or our spouses, or our children, as if they were the enemy. Do you remember what our Savior did when Peter was tempted to deny the need for Christ to suffer and to die? When Jesus had told him and the other disciples very clearly and very plainly that he must go to the cross, there's no other way. There's no other way for man to be saved. What did Jesus do? He spoke not to Peter, but to Satan. The one who had enticed Peter. Peter, And he said, get behind me, Satan. You see, he knew who the real enemy was. Our Lord Jesus understood that he was engaged in a real battle with a real but spiritual and unseen enemy, the devil. Do we realize that? Do we really believe that? Do we live our lives as if that were true? To understand the nature of this battle and the nature of our enemy, that one who's called in that hymn that we sang just a few moments ago, our ancient foe, to understand that we have an enemy who has been conspiring for millennia and who knows our human nature and our human weaknesses better than we could ever know them, better than the best psychologist could ever understand the human mind, a malevolent intelligence far superior to anything that you or I could ever imagine or conceived, To know and to understand all this is to begin to realize how weak and how helpless we are against this enemy. This is why Paul says what he says in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong, not in yourselves, but in the Lord and in the power of his might. We need to understand how weak we are and how strong this enemy is, to understand how great the danger is of ignoring him and his wiles. Brings us to our second point, and that comforting point, Christ's strength. Christ's strength. It's only as we realize our own weakness that we will ever begin to comprehend how great is our need of help. You don't understand how weak you are, you won't understand how great your need is of help. And this is why so often as we're speaking to unbelievers 
and we haven't laid the foundation, we simply begin to talk about sin, and they don't even have any concept of what sin is and how great an offense it is against God. They don't even have any concept of who God is. They don't have any foundation whatsoever for any of these things. Of course, they're not going to begin to see their need of help. They're not going to see how weak they are. As Martin Lloyd-Jones rightly says, this is why people pay such slight heed to our text. And he means this passage that we're looking at. That is why we know so little about what it is to stand and to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We've never realized, and and now he's speaking of Christians, we've never realized our own need, how great our need is. We We just haven't realized it. We haven't even thought about it very much. We need to be absolutely persuaded that there is no strength in us except the strength to sin, which is no strength at all, properly understood, but great weakness. Utter rottenness of bones and rottenness of soul, utter corruption and misery and living death. In ourselves, as Paul says in Romans 7, and he's speaking of the Christian experience, we find no good thing but only a battle, a constant warfare between the flesh and the spirit. And the point of it all is that we can't make a single millimeter of progress in the Christian life until we are convinced to our core that we have no strength whatsoever for the fight. None at all. That the battle belongs to the Lord and not to to us. Do you believe that? I don't just mean do you believe that as a proposition to be held in your mind. I mean do you believe that like you believe that you need air to breathe and water to drink and food to eat? Do you believe that you are weak and only Christ has the strength that you need to fight this good fight of faith? One of the most important things that we need to notice about these verses is the order. The order. Had you ever noticed the order? The order of these phrases is so very significant. Paul says to the Ephesians, be strong in the Lord. Only then does he go on to say, put on the whole armor of God. He doesn't begin with what we do. Not at all. It's not as if putting on the whole armor of God is some work that we perform in our own strength. We've got, to, we've got to muster up the strength to put on this armor. He doesn't say that. He doesn't begin with what we do. He doesn't begin with our activity or our works, even our works in union with Christ. He doesn't begin there. He begins as he always has throughout this epistle with union with Christ and then with our response to God in our union with Christ. The point is clear in the very grammar and structure of the text. All of your strength to put on the armor is in Christ and in Christ alone. You cannot put this armor on in your own strength. And if you try, you will fail. And I'm sure if you're like me, you've already tried and you've already failed many times and you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a task too great for you. Your enemy is too strong for you and you are too weak to do so much as prepare yourself to fight against him, much less to fight against him. You're like the armies of Israel against Goliath until David comes along in the strength of the Lord. Our family went to the recreation of the Jamestown settlement last week and we were walking around this little replica of Jamestown with little replica cannons and buildings designed to look as if they would have looked as if as they would have looked in the early 17th century and my children happened to see these little child-sized suits of armor heavy they're, they're, they were metal these little child-sized suits of armor quite heavy especially for a child and most of them had trouble putting these little suits of armor on without help but of course they wanted to put them on they all wanted to put them on and it, and they saw one putting them on and the other one saw the other one putting them on and wanted to put it on as well and when it came to the youngest 
He was begging for me to put the armor on him. And so I put the little breastplate over his shoulders, and I was wondering how long he would even be able to hold up with this breastplate on him. And then I put the helmet on his head, and, and I, tried to, I quickly tried to get a picture of him with this helmet on. And he's sitting there, and the helmet's over his eyes, and he's trying to hold the helmet off of his head because it, it, it's heavy. I put the helmet on his head, I, uh, and, and there he was. He, he's got this helmet. He, he, it's going down over his eyes. He's trying as hard as he can to hold his head up to keep the helmet from falling even farther down. Before I could get a good photo... I had to get that heavy metal helmet off of his little head. It was just too much. It was too much for him. And that's exactly how it is for us. We can't even put the armor of God on unless we do so in the power of Christ's might. You see, in the ancient world, if you had a suit of armor, you had somebody to help you to put that suit of armor on. You couldn't do it by yourself. We can't even put the armor on without Christ's strength. One of the biggest problems for us when we try to understand how to live as Christians is that we try to separate things that can't be separated. Justification and sanctification. We try to separate things that, that cannot be separated. Repentance and faith. We try to separate these things. On the one hand, there's this kind of Jesus takes the Jesus take the wheel kind of theology. Sometimes you'll hear that expressed in, in, in a ridiculous little slogan. Let go and, and let God. Just let go and let God. There's something that both of those sayings are getting at that's true. Jesus is the author of our faith and the captain of our salvation and the sanctifier of, of our souls. Apart from him, we can do nothing. But we fail to emphasize the other aspect of the doctrine of sanctification. Apart from him, I can do nothing, but I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Put on the whole armor of God. Rest in his strength, in his might, in the power of his might. But put on the whole armor of God. There are two things here that are emphasized at the same time. You see, the same error is made in the other direction. We think that we can put on the whole armor of God in our own strength, and we think that we have everything that we need in ourselves, and we think that the Christian life is simply a matter of willing and doing, doing the right things. If you have all the right principles, if you have all the right understanding, you can just do it. You just, just do it, like, like that Nike slogan from years ago. Just do it. And both of these extremes are false. And both of these extremes lead to an immature and a lopsided kind of Christian life. We need to put on the whole armor of God, but we can only do it relying upon the strength that is in Christ alone. Let me illustrate this again from our family's trip to Jamestown. It seems to me that one difference between Jamestown settlement and colonial Williamsburg is in the way that the people in their period costumes treat their work. So at Colonial Williamsburg, you find yourself talking to people who are playing the part of a person from that era. And then at Jamestown, they're not playing a part. At least they weren't when we were there. They're not playing a part, but they're telling you how things were. So there they are. They're, they're wearing this 17th century clothing, but they're speaking to you from a 21st century perspective. And so as our family walks up to the blacksmith's shop there in Jamestown, there was a man standing over an anvil. He, he's apparently making a sword. And as, as we began to speak to him, he tells us that this is not what I would have been doing if I was really in Jamestown. I wouldn't have been making a sword. And the reason why I wouldn't have been making a sword, I'm just doing this for a show, really. I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be doing this if I was really there. If I was really there, I would buy a sword from England because the English are the ones who make them cheaper, better, and faster than anyone else in the world. So why in the world would I be trying to make a sword that would be completely ineffective? I would get my sword from England. And you see, the point is, is that all of the resources that we need are to be found outside of ourselves. We get them from another. They are supplied to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
if you and I are ever going to have the armor and the weaponry that we need to fight against the devil, there's only one place to get it. And that's from the Lord Jesus Christ. And thanks be to God that every aspect, every piece of the armor points to something that was purchased by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we'll see as we continue through this series on spiritual warfare. That brings us to our last point. God's armor. And remember, it's God's armor. It's not our armor. It's God's armor. Supplied to us by God himself. What we have here in these verses is a wonderful promise of provision from the Lord. Do you see it that way? This is a wonderful promise of provision from the Lord. The promise aspect comes in verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that, that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. And, and we come to this and we say, well, that sounds like a command to me. Doesn't it? But you see, as we've already seen, the order, put off, dear brothers and sisters, all reliance on self in your warfare against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Put on Christ. Put on all that Christ has purchased for you in his own warfare, in our flesh and blood, in this world. And you see that phrase, that you may be able to stand? That phrase is the key. That you may be able to stand. He says it again in verse 13. Take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Sometimes well-meaning brothers and sisters will use the doctrines of grace in order to excuse themselves from striving and fighting in the Christian life. I'm totally depraved. How can, how can I do that? I can't, I can't do this. It's impossible. And the answer, of course, is yes. It's impossible. In your own strength. But in Christ, our text tells us, you are able to stand. You are able to withstand in that armor that Christ has provided for you. Christ has purchased everything necessary for your salvation and for your sanctification. The resources are not in you. The resources are in Him. The armor is made not by you, but it's made by Him and provided by Him. The provision has been made. Every piece of the armor points to some aspect of the person and the work of Christ, as we'll see in coming weeks. And so here's what you're called to do as one who is in union with Jesus Christ, as one who has been given the gift of repentance and faith, as one who is called to put off and to put on, as one who is called to walk as a, a child of God in this world, to walk worthy of your calling, put on that armor of God. How? By faith. That's how. If you have no faith, you will not be able to put this armor on. But Paul is not talking to those that he presumes are without faith. He's talking to saints. He's talking to the church. He's even talking to young children, as we've seen already in chapter 6. Children, he's talking to you. If you're in Christ, he's saying to you that you too, no matter how small you are in stature, you too are able to put on this armor. Because he has purchased it for you. And because he gives you the strength. And because he gives you his Holy Spirit who comes alongside you and aids you in putting that armor on. Just as I, as a little one's daddy, came alongside to put that armor on my littlest child. Put on the armor by faith and then stand by faith in his strength and in the power of his might. Let me put it somewhat differently. Putting on the whole armor of God means putting on Christ. That's what it means. It means 
putting him on in the sense that you have him and his life and his death and his resurrection and his present mediatorial reign before you as the entirety of your strength and the entirety of your hope. When you become discouraged, what do you do? You put on Christ. When you feel tempted, what do you do? You put on Christ. When you lack wisdom, what do you do? You put on Christ. When the fiery darts come, you put on Christ. But how do I do that, you ask? You begin by meditating deeply and prayerfully and humbly on the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And this is why, this is why it's so crucial to come back again and again to the Gospels. You should be in the Gospels regularly. In fact, one of the things that I'd, I'm hoping to do soon is to go back to one of the Gospels and preach one of the Gospels because I haven't done so in a few years. You go back again and again to that picture painted for us of the life and ministry and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of those major events that spell out the gospel for us. When Christ came to be baptized by John and the Spirit of God came upon him and he began his earthly ministry, do you remember, children, do you remember what the very first thing was that happened? He was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. If you are in Christ, dear brothers and sisters, Christ was tempted for you. Christ was tempted for you. So that in all of your temptations, you might know that he was tempted in your place. So that when you fail, when you fail, you know that your Savior will not fail. When there's a chink in your armor, you know that there's no chink in Christ's armor. When Adam failed, and where, where, where Adam failed and where you have failed, Christ stood in the power of the Holy Spirit and he did not fail. That is where we derive our strength from, is in knowing that we have a Savior who did not fail, who could not fail. It was impossible for him to fail. Or think of his miracles. Think about his great power to heal. Think about his power to raise the dead. Think about how often he demonstrated his power over Satan and his kingdom by casting out the demon spirits. Think about how he spoke a word and they shrank back from him. I said this to the children this morning in our catechism class as we looked at question 26 of the catechism. Christ's office of a king. And we, we talked about how Christ right now is restraining and conquering his enemies. And we talked about how one of the main ways that he is doing that right now is through the preaching of the word so that when the, the word is faithfully preached, the kingdom of God is advancing and the voice of Christ is being heard and the enemies of Christ are shrinking back. And men and women and boys and girls who were enemies of God are being made the friends of God in Christ. That is a power that no earthly king has ever had. That's the power of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who bound the strong man and cast him out. He saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. When you feel helpless, put on the whole armor of God. Remember the power of Christ or consider his, his triumph of the principalities and powers of the enemy at the cross. He defeated sin there. Satan deployed every weapon that he had to get Jesus to the cross. And it was precisely there that Christ defeated that ancient foe once and for all. By destroying him who had the power of death and triumphing over him in it. Meditate deeply, regularly on the cross. Take hold of the blood of the atonement. Consider what that means, what Christ has accomplished for you by his death, but don't stop there. Put on the whole armor of God by meditating on the power of Christ in rising again on the third day. Your own resurrection is tied up in that. Your own hope of resurrection is right there knowing that Jesus has risen from the dead. 
death and the grave could not hold him, could not possibly hold him. Nor can they hold you if you are truly in Jesus Christ. Put on the whole armor of God. Even as death approaches, especially as death approaches. This is what it means to put on the whole armor of God. It means to rest and rely entirely on the strength and power of Christ in your warfare against sin and Satan. Yes, there is something for you to do. You need to be putting on the armor. You need to put it on again and again throughout the Christian life. You never stop putting it on. When you fail to put it on, you remember, I failed. And you put it on. But you don't put it on in your own strength nor do you fight in your own strength. You take up the armor by faith, you fight by faith, and that means that you take it up relying on the power and blood and death and resurrection and present reign of your Savior, Jesus Christ. In our union with Christ, we have all the spiritual resources that we need to be more than conquerors through him who loved us and laid down his life for us in his victory at the cross. We have a powerful enemy. We ourselves are helpless and weak. Weaker than we know. This is why we're called to make no provision for the flesh or the lusts thereof. We are weak. Take heed lest you fall. But Christ is our strength. Christ is our shield. Christ is our very great reward. In the words of William Grinnell, the author of a whole book on this passage, The Christian in Complete Armor. This is the Apostle's purpose, to beat us off from leaning on our own strength and to encourage us to make use of God's almighty power as freely as if it were our own whenever Satan's assaults come. Isn't that a wonderful encouragement? May we... Be like our father Abraham in the faith, who by faith was persuaded that whatsoever God has promised in his word, he is also able and willing to perform. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God and Father, how we thank you for this precious portion of your word, which teaches us to rely on the strength of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in our putting on of the whole armor that you have provided us. We pray that you would help us to grow in putting this armor on. We pray that you would help us to fight the good fight of faith, to wage this warfare against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we pray that as we do, we would grow more and more like our Savior, the Lord Jesus. All this we pray in his name. For his sake.